Thank you very much. Um, I'm really delighted to be back here. I think it's been about maybe almost 10 years since I was, was at this conference before. And I suppose for anybody working in CM, the last 10 years have been quite extraordinary. Uh, I certainly want to congratulate the society on 60 years. I didn't realize it was that old because I, I know the US CM Foundation was fully uh, formed there for society one or two years before this, which is, which is incredible. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so, So um, I'm delighted to talk to you about some of the real-world data related to the new therapy CAF-TRIO. And for the purpose of, the, of this talk, I, I thought I, I need to put it in perspective, and I'm going to present a little brief overview of the therapies that we've seen uh, change people's lives in CF over the last 10 years. We're grouping them as highly effective modulator therapy, or HEMT. And uh, this is really either capture and cap trio, but I just want to go through the data in the clinical trials. And I use the term unreal world, and I'll explain that a little bit later when we look at why we really need real world data to ensure the, the value and the, and, the, and the utility of these treatments. I'm then going to talk about real world experience and particularly the impact of lung disease and uh, certain other outcomes. And there's two studies I'll be focusing on. One's called the PROMISE study, which is out of the United States, uh, looking at their, their real world experience of cap trio since we licensed there. And then also the RECOVER study, which is led by Paul McNally here in Ireland and involves centres from Ireland and the UK, looking at our own experience of it. And also, there's been a huge amount of work looking at, CAP, uh, at CF now in the age of, of modulators. So we're going to look at the impact that these treatments may have and things that weren't looked at in the big clinical trials, like GI side effects, like sinus disease, like diabetes. We've also, as has been mentioned, there have been some emerging side effects that we've seen with some of these new therapies that have had their own challenges, and I think that will be a focus of some of the discussions later on today. Uh, so I'll go through some of that. And then, of course, there's new areas of uncertainty that, uh, and why these um, patient groups that weren't included in the trials, such as the use of drugs like CAP-TRIO during pregnancy, and also, of course, how do you use these drugs in patients that receive lung transplantation? So just to remind you all, uh, I mean, it's hard to believe it's 12 years ago that Ivacaptor was first published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing such incredible beneficial effects that really had not been seen in any of the clinical trials on the CF before. And um, what we saw in that trial was that when people received this drug, within two weeks, they had a huge improvement in lung function of 11%, which is twice what we've really seen with other drugs like as if they're mice and then aids and all of those other treatments. There was a very substantial reduction in exacerbations, which was a huge endpoint uh, for CF patients. Very significant improvements in quality of life, and again, much higher than had been seen with some of the other therapies. But what really was so unusual and new about these treatments was that the sweat chloride, which is a very important measure and how we diagnose cystic fibrosis. And for people who don't have CF, it's below 30. For people that might have milder form of CF, it's between 30 and 60. And above 60 is a diagnosis of CF. And the vast majority of people who have CF will have a sweat chloride of 100, so way over the, sort of the, the, the normal levels. And what we saw was when this drug was taken, within two weeks, the first time they checked the sweat chloride after people started the drug, it came down below that 60 millimole diagnostic criteria for CF. So somebody on this drug would walk into a clinic, if they had a sweat test to diagnose CF, you wouldn't be able to do it. So that was an extraordinary thing that had never been seen in, in CF before. And this was the launch of Ivacaptor, which is now, you know, we've, we've now had, it was approved about two years later, with now almost 10 years of data in Ireland about how successful that's been. And that's also was then subsequently studied in other genotypes similar to the initial genotype we've looked at, which was a, 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 a mutation called the Celtic mutation, or G551D, and it was found to be quite effective. It was only in a, a, quite a small proportion of people in Ireland and, and around the world. So what we really were looking for was a treatment that might be effective in patients that had the most common type of CF and the most severe type of CF, as Charlie's mentioned, which is the F508 del homozygous. And multiple studies were done and uh, different therapies were tried. We had our Cambi and some Kevi that showed some benefit, but then CAF-TRIO came along. And this was studied and published in The Lancet back in 2019. Uh, uh, and what we saw, and this was compared to Sinkevi, which was a sort of standard of care at the time, is that on top of the existing treatment, which was beneficial, there was a further 10% improvement in lung function. There was a huge increase in quality of life. And that is really key because uh, Alexander's here who developed this questionnaire assessing quality of life. 
And we were able to say that a four point change in that meant that people had a noticeable improvement in the quality of life, it meant something. And it was 17 in, the, in, in this trial. So this again was a huge improvement in quality of life, which is key, because it's not all about the numbers and quantity, it's all about quality as well. And also the sweat fluoride again, for the first time ever in patients who are F homozygous, dropped down from 90, it was a little bit lower than 100 because they were on some heavy, but dropped down below that 60 threshold, which really, really was very, very exciting in that this is a therapy that addressed the cause of CF and also had substantial benefits. We also then looked at another group, which were people that had one copy of f 508 gal which is a common cause of CF, but also a second mutation that was quite what was severe. So this is your very severe type of cystic fibrosis that's usually diagnosed in very young children, and we've heard a lot about that already. And this time, calf triodo was compared to, to placebo because there was no treatment for this at all. And it, the, it included people over 12 years old. And at 24 weeks of treatment, what we saw was a huge improvement in lung function of 14%, a, a, a significant and substantial reduction in uh, exacerbations of 63%, and including hospitalizations and, and length of time in hospital, which we know affects people's quality of life so much. Again, I mentioned about quality of life measure that, uh, with Ivacaptor, which uh, with the previous study was up by 17. It was up by 20 in this group. So that's a, another huge improve, improvement in quality of life. And likewise, the sweat chloride went down below the diagnostic criteria for CF in the vast majority of patients. So this was very encouraging. This was also seen subsequently in studies. These studies have only recently come out. The study looking at it in two to five year olds shows that a measure called LCI, because we can't do breathing tests like FEV1 in young children, we use a test called LCI, which in essence looks at how gas empties from the lung. And it looks at it compared to normal people. And what it showed was that when patients with CF received the treatment, it, it improved their, their lung clearance quite dramatically and statistically significantly, also dropped sweat chloride. And the same effects were seen in six to 11 year olds as well. So not only were, were adults and younger children benefiting, or, or older children benefiting from this, but it also applied to, ch to, to very young children as well, so that, and clear benefits. And that's why the drug has been recently approved and will benefit these patients. Another group I want to talk about, though, is that I mentioned Ivacaptor as a single monotherapy that we have a lot of people on for 12 years. We also looked at whether the CAF-TRIO was better than Ivacaptor alone in those patients who were already on Ivacaptor doing very well. And what we saw is that CAF-TRIO was, was at a, a little bit of benefit. Lung function went up by about 3.7%, so not as much as we've seen with some of the other studies. But remember, people on Ivacaptor had already seen 10% improvement when they went on Ivacaptor alone. There was definitely a further improvement in quality of life. And the sweat chloride, in fact, with CAF-TRIO in people who are already on Ivacaptor, in many cases dropped down to below 30, which is even below those of carriers, down completely into the normal range, which is very encouraging. When you broke it down, though, into two different groups, one's called gating, which is the one that we would most commonly see in Ireland, which is the G551D and, and, and another mutation similar to it, Lung function actually did go up a little bit more, went up by about 6%, quality of life improved, and so did sweat chloride. So these are all very good signs of response. With other types, it was probably not as much. So for some people on Ivacaptor, maybe Ivacaptor is all they need, and that we don't need to change them all over to CAPTRIO immediately. So why do we need real world data? So when we're doing clinical trials, I suppose what we're looking to do is identify And that excludes a lot of people who may get the drug in, uh, in the future. So what we find is that, for example, with clinical trials, with severe patients with severe lung disease, lung function with 40 percent, they're not included. People with mild lung disease aren't included. People with difficult to treat infections, like non-tuberculous mycobacterium or burkholderia, are excluded. Patients who have had transplant, either lung transplant or kidney or liver, are excluded. People who may be pregnant are excluded as well. It's also an artificial design. People come every two weeks or every three months and so on to, to schedule visits. And, and probably what the, the key difference between real world and clinical trials is that if, if you look at people who are in clinical trials compared to other people who aren't, there's a, there's a lot of differences. And the reasons are probably that the doctors or the clinicians who are recruiting them are recruiting people who they know are going to show up for visits, they know are going to be adhering to their treatment. So they're kind of a more of an ideal population and often don't necessarily reflect what's going to happen when the drug is, is rolled out outside of the clinical trial setting. 
And also, from a pharmacoeconomic perspective, and of course, this is a big issue when it comes to CF drugs, when you see the effects in a, the ideal setting of a clinical trial, that's often used to estimate the cost and value of a drug, and that may not translate into the actual co uh, cost effectiveness of it in real life. So it's really important that we get real world data. And the typical way we get real world data is by looking at things like registries or organizing trials to look at people in a normal clinical environment or in general practice. So I want to talk a bit about eye capture again, and this is a, 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 a really to also highlight the importance of registries. And I see our registry group are here uh, today, and I think we're going to be speaking a bit later on about our experience of registries. But uh, eye capture is, is now 10 years old uh, in terms of its license in Ireland, and it's very important that as an expensive therapy, we're able to show the government that this is actually effective. And our registry, remarkably, has been collecting data you know, that you've all signed up to be in or your children are in, and it's really important that we continue the registry to do that. And they've shown in, the, in a study that was published uh, three years ago that the average lung function improvement uh, with eye capture in the real world setting is 8.3%, is which is not too far off we saw in the clinical trials. And that is, 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 is great to see, it's very encouraging that it's actually working in, in practice. Uh, also, exacerbations or infections that people get with CF, that reduced by 40 to 60 percent, which is really important as well. So, the registry was able to show in the real world, after 10 years of experience with eye capture, that we're seeing improvements in lung function and exacerbations that were the same as seen in that ideal setting of a clinical trial. Uh, a larger study that was done by the UK and US registry, which is a larger registry than ours, has a lot more patients, we were also able to look at things like the need for transplantation and so on, which is a really good marker that there's a mortality impact of these drugs, and they're able to show a dramatic reduction in transplant needs for people who are on eye capture compared to the prior to that. So that's that's very encouraging about that. with eye capture. And I think that's we've ten years of experience with eye capture. I think that what we're seeing with eye capture, we're likely to see at least that, and probably even more with Cap Trio, but uh, as we go forward. In terms of the where, what kind of data do we have in the real world with CapTrio? CapTrio has only been licensed since I think 2019 in the US, so we only have a couple of years or three or four years of experience of it. The Promise study, though, was set up by the CF Foundation looking at how this drug works in, in, uh, in the real world. They followed almost 500 patients and they followed them for six months. And what you can see here is that lung function goes up dramatically about 10%. Sweat chloride goes down again below that 60 millimoles from diagnostic criteria. And nutrition also improves. And, the, and you can see here, lung function at 10%, sweat chloride down by 47% from that 100 number, so that's below 60. Quality of life, again, in the real world, is up by 20 points. Again, very similar to seeing clinical trials and way beyond what we consider to be meaningful. What they did, though, which was interesting, is they looked at adherence to medications. And one of our concerns is that when people go on cap trio, they're going to stop taking their regular medication. What they saw was that 76% of people who were on saline, that dropped down to 68, which is a small number. 87 on DNA is reduced down to 81. That's, that's not a huge drop either. But 51% who are on inhaled antibiotics dropped down to 33%. And that is a worry. And that's why I put that in there. And that's probably going to be some of the take home messages that uh, with this talk is about what do we do with the treatments that people are already on. So, the first question is is it safe to stop saving our DNAs in people who are on CapTrio? So, the Simplify study, which is a study organized to ask that very question, uh, was published in the last Security Medicine just last year. And they looked at 671 patients from 80 centers in the US. Importantly, average lung function in that group was 97%. The inclusion criteria was actually lung function above 70. So just this doesn't apply to everybody, it's an important message. And after six weeks of follow-up, they saw that there was no significant drop in lung function, and there was no, either with people who were randomized to stop their hypertonic saline or stop their DNA. So it looks like it was safe to stop it in terms of lung function changes over a relatively short follow-up period. I think that needs to be emphasized. But it, it seems to be okay to do that if you have mild lung disease. And that's the, that's the key me message there. So in some patients who are doing well and have trio, that, and they've got good lung function, uh, it may be okay to stop the saline in the DNAs. 
is a second study that's ongoing in the UK right now called CS Storm, and that is a much longer follow-up period of a year, and that will look at things like exacerbations, which will be important as well. So we need a little bit more information about that, but so far it's reassuring. So what about inhaled antibiotics? I know John is going to be giving a talk later on today about uh, antibi um, infections in CF. So this is actually from a similar study. It's actually part of the PROMISE study was looking at improvement in CFDR function and how that impacts sputum microbiology in patients who've started cap trio. And I suppose they, they followed 236 patients, so a big study, followed for six months, and they got serial sputum samples over that six months. And what you can see is that only a very small proportion of patients had a drop in the presence of pseudomonas, right? And some of that was that they aren't expectorating the sputum at all. So that's a, a, a new challenge now, is trying to see if there is pseudomonas there in people who aren't spontaneously expectorating the sputum. But I suppose the key thing is that in the majority of patients, that pseudomonas remains present in the sputum, which is a, a concern that people are not taking their inhaled antibiotics. And we did the study, in fact, in fact with a lot of the same authors on this PROMISE study that I'm showing here, they did a study looking at our G551D patients 10 years ago in Ivacaster. And what they saw, uh, what we saw in our group, was that sputum microbiology does improve a little bit for a few years, but it starts to rise again after about year four to year six. And, and even though we're not seeing maybe the same number of exacerbations we used to see, pseudomonas is still there and it can still cause lung damage. So I suppose where DNAs and hypertonic saline in selected people may be stopped, and inhaled antibiotics should remain in, as is if you're growing pseudomonas in your sputum or if you have grown it repeatedly before your, um, you start your cap trio. And right now we're trying to think about protocols to see if, if pseudomonas is eradicated, and that may happen in a few cases, we may need to be doing things like induced sputum or, or even bronchoscopies to try and identify if, if it is the case. And if that's the case, then it may be safe to stop it. But right now the recommendation will be to continue. So what about nutrition as well? So in all the clinical trials, I mean, we all know, I mean, our dietitians spend a lot of time pushing people to try and keep their BMIs up, and that's exactly what CAP trio can do. You see significant increases in BMI with patients who are receiving CAP trio uh, going up to six months. And as you can see, the graphs are still rising, and I know this is sometimes a bit of a challenge that people are gaining weight, which is great. We always encourage people to do that, but sometimes they're gaining maybe more weight than they want to. And we actually are seeing that some people with, with CF, which I suppose is again reflects success, but we are seeing people that now are getting to be overweight, uh, uh, um, weight, weight gain, with weight gain. So that's something that we just have to keep an eye on. Uh, the, the weight gain seemed to be the greatest in those who had gone from um, of the cap trio from no treatment as opposed to cap trio from having been on either cap or on yeah, um, Simkevi or, uh, or, um, or Cambi before that. So what about our local experience in Ireland then with Captrio? So that's from the US. So uh, Paul McNally put together a study called The Cover, which involves centers from Ireland, and you can see Limerick, there's a few centers from Dublin there, so the pediatric centers in Temple Street, Crumlin Tala, and ourselves. And then we have Belfast, we had two hospitals up there, pediatric and, and adult. And then we have the Brompton in London. So it's a, it's a large study that Paul put together, looking at real world experience with Captrio. It's going on for two years, so we only have one year of data that Paul has shared with me here to show you. Uh, 181 patients are in there. They're mainly Irish, adult, and actually there's a lot of pediatric patients in there. And it, the title of my story was Real World for, uh, the title of my talk was Real World with Adult and Pediatrics. And this is going, going to uh, include a lot of pediatric patients. And what they've shown is substantial improvements in CF, in sweat chloride, um, lung function, BMI and quality of life, very similar to seen in the trials, and that's after one year, and it's going up another year. The LCI that I mentioned before as well, which is kind of a marker of very early lung disease in younger children, that also improved significantly. They also showed reduced antibiotic use, and I suppose that's a, a key thing in terms of how these drugs impact quality of life as well as the uh, ad admissions to hospital, and you can see here, there's a very dramatic changes here. And I suppose one thing that struck me, which we haven't really looked at before in, in CF and, and something we may need to start looking at more, is the use of oral antibiotics. And what Paul has shown here is that there were 218 courses of oral antibiotics prescribed in this cohort 
uh, before ETI, and that dropped down to 93. So that's again a 60% reduction with uh, IV courses from 90 down to 19. Now, some of this was during COVID when we saw a drop off in exacerbations because of, of people isolating themselves and not getting usual sort of viral infections. But still, we, we do believe that the, you know, at least uh, 50 to 60% reduction in uh, exacerbations with CAF3 is what we are seeing in our clinics. Um, the other thing they looked at is adherence. And I know, I think I was gonna talk a bit about that later on. Uh, but there was evidence that people were not taking their DNAs or their hypotonic salines. And again, I suppose it's not surprising if people aren't producing sputum, they don't feel that they need to, or they're feeling very well. But I think it's just, you've got to be very careful about that. And I think they just need to make sure that if they are going to make those decisions to do it, talk to their CF team. We can use data from the Simplify to inform people. We can, if you are going to come off the medications, we can monitor closely to make sure there's no signs of any, any clinical deterioration. So the other sort of big question is that we see that lung function dramatically goes up quite quickly in patients who receive corrective therapy, but to truly modify disease in CF, there's a few other things that we need to do. So let's look at an imaginary graph here of somebody with CF pre-modulator and the lung function decline as they get older. So in this, you see lung function remains around 100%, fairly steep decline there, and then it gets down below 40, in this case when the person's about 30 years old. And what happens then is that they may need to be referred for transplant, right? So if we have a therapy that increases lung function by 10%, but the trajectory is still the same, it's not really going to have a very dramatic impact. Maybe it might delay the need for transplant by about four or five years, as you can see here, because that graph only moves a, sl a, sm a small bit to, the, a bit to the side. What you really want to look at is, can we change the rate of decline in lung function? And if you can change the rate of decline over time, then you're going to see an extension of that period of time before lung function gets severe enough to need transplant to get down below 40. And uh, as you can see here, that, that would be the ideal goal. And ideally what you want is both of those. A, a, a nice increase at the start, and then an alteration in that rate of decline so that people, by the time they're 50 or 60, they need, they need transplant, or even, even, even older than that. So what does CAF-TRIO do to rate of decline in lung function? Now, this is a study that was done and published in JCF just a, two, uh, a year ago. It's not fully real world. What this study was, it took people who had been in the clinical trials and looked at their lung function decline over time and compared that to a matched group of patients in a registry that were matched for all the risk factors that would normally be associated with lung function decline in CF. What's very unusual about this is that the rate of decline in people pre-ETI, before CAF-TRIO, was 1.92, about 2% per year, which is what we've always described as being the rate of decline in people before correctors. But what they saw with people who were on CAF trio over two years was no decline. In fact, it went up. And, and we are seeing that there are patients now with CAF trio where their lung function is going up quite quickly after starting it, but then it may continue to rise for you know, longer and longer after they're on the drug. So they, they showed no rate of decline. Now this is again, two, two caveats to this. The first one is that these are clinical trial patients, so they're a little bit different, to, uh, as I've already described. And the second thing is that uh, this took place during COVID as well, where I suppose people weren't having exacerbations as much. Sometimes people's adherence during COVID also improved that they may be taking their therapies more because of the concerns about COVID. So that is a factor there, but still what you're looking at is at least a stabilization of lung function decline, which is, a, which is which, I think if you think about the graph I just showed you here, it should extend life expectancy, or extend the time to, to transplant need quite dramatically. So then what about outside of the lung? So all of the clinical trials are focused on lung disease because lung disease is the single most severe cause of, of, uh, of death in people with cystic fibrosis. So what the, the, these studies I'm going to present to you now looked at was abdominal symptoms in patients who received CAF-TRIO. So the first one I'm going to discuss is PROMISE GI substudy, and this is the PROMISE study I mentioned earlier of about 500 patients, and it was a substudy where they looked at abdominal symptoms in patients who had CF and were put on CAF-TRIO. And what you can see here, and I'm not sure how well it, 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 it presents there, but all the symptoms of like nausea, vomiting, fullness, bloating, abdominal pain, heartburn regurgitation, all improved dramatically with taking CAF-TRIO. 
there was a, they have a, a, a quality of abdominal pain score uh, that they have here as well, which is, uh, again, was much improved. You can see in essence that everything um, to, is to the left of that line going down from zero, indicating that there were benefits in abdominal symptoms. The recover study that I mentioned to you is also done one. They do, a, it's a slightly different abdominal uh, symptom score called the CF abdo score, but it's a validated assessment of abdominal symptoms. And it breaks down into things like pain, reflux symptoms, uh, disorders of bowel movement, disorder of appetite, um, and, uh, and quality of life and, um, and uh, impaired pa and, and pain. And what you can see here is that the red indicates where the patient was in terms of symptomatology before CapTrio, and that reduces down into that blue area there, indicating that all of these different areas are, 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 are components of abdominal symptoms improve with CapTrio. A second study was done in Germany, which in essence just shows the same thing. So you always like to see validation of your results. So what you can see here is that all those markers of abdominal symptoms seem to improve with uh, CapTrio. So that's important as a, a independent of the if, impact it has on lung function. What about other conditions in cystic fibrosis? So sinus disease, there's been three studies and they have, they validated a rather uh, uniquely named quality of sinus symptom as questionnaire called the SNOP20. And uh, I'd say they had, they had a lot of fun putting that one together and coming up with that, uh, that, that anagram. Um, but, but I would say, and I, I, to keep it simple, all three studies show the same things that the SNOP20 improved, so we can take, that's a take home message. And then the, 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 you can see the CT scans here as well. I mean, just to show you here, you can see that there's the, in A there, you can see the sinus on the left there, it's completely occluded, it's completely clear on the other side. So there are, so you can see here that there are significant benefits in terms of sinus disease and symptomatology as well. And likewise, CF related diabetes, there actually haven't been as many studies of this because I suppose there's a lot of debate about how you really monitor how diabetes improves. But this is a study from Switzerland where they looked at the OGTT. So you, all people with CF are familiar with the, uh, the oral glucose tolerance test. You take a, a, gla a glass of sugary drink and then you measure sugar intermittently over time after it. And what they show was that the peak, that sort of, that sort of curve the peak that the sugars follow was a lot better when they were on CapTrio as well. One of the, the caveats here is that it's not necessarily a direct independent effect of CapTrio on pancreatic diabetic function. It may actually just reflect that the things that drive diabetes sugars being high are a lot of that infection and all of the inflammation in the lung, that that's improved. So it may be more secondary to the uh, lung effects than necessarily a direct effect on diabetes. But still, it did show an improvement. But unfortunately though, as great as CAF trio is and the impact it has on lung and, uh, and other aspects of CF, it's very clear, uh, there are some side effects and there are new ones that perhaps that we didn't expect uh, that weren't seen in the clinical trials. So I suppose in the clinical trials, what was identified was that there was people got rashes and sometimes by ad adjusting the dose, you could help people uh, deal with the rash and the rash would go away. Abnormal liver function test was also a, a challenge as well. And that's been studied in the real world as well. And there's a study that was published in JCF this year showing that about uh, three and a half percent, uh, in total about 5% of people will have abnormal liver function tests. Many can get away with dose adjustments, but some it gets to the point where it's high enough that you've got to actually stop the drug and discontinue it. But I suppose since approval, there's been a few new side effects that have been identified. And I think one of the key ones are, are mental health changes. And Alexander's gonna talk a lot more about that later on. But that's definitely something that I think was, was a little bit unexpected, but then people began to see it. And then as, as we go to meetings and we talk about different side effects, people are seeing it became a much more, it seems to be a more common problem. And there's, and, it, and there's multiple aspects of it, which I said Alexander will chat about, but the um, anxiety and depression has been recognized. It can be very severe and suicidality has been described. Uh, now, it can be managed with dose adjustments, but we've had patients where we've reduced the dose and then we reintroduce it and its symptoms come back almost immediately. So you just have to be very careful about that and, and, and be cautious that that is a recognized side effect. We've seen pay, uh, patients with testicular pain and cysts, which is, re reflects increased CFDR activity. And there's a case series of seven cases. And I think every large CF center has seen some patients complain of those symptoms. And then ironically, I showed you that abdominal pain and symptoms with, uh, like that improve with CapTrio. We've also seen some patients who've taken CapTrio 
for the first time and they've actually developed abdominal pain. And abdominal pain was described in the clinical trials that we have seen patients who have never really had much of a GI problem with uh, CF, but then getting constipation, even GIOS when they start Captrio. So you just got to be cautious of that. So that brings me on then to talking about CF pure modulation after lung transplant, which is really, a, 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 it, there's a lot of debate about this at the moment. Um, the, the reason is that you've got to try and ba balance the benefits and the risks of a cap tree in this patient population. And I suppose one of the things that we've, I've highlighted here is that the benefits of cap trio are clearly mainly see, seen in CF lung disease. And that's based on the impact of cap tree on CF your function within the lung. And obviously after transplant, the transplanted lung does not have CF, so it does not have CF your activity uh, to be um, recovered with, with drugs like Captrio. So what you're looking at post-transplant is mainly targeting the non-pulmonary complications of CF. And that is really re related to sinus disease, GI disease with GIOS, which is still present, and perhaps, although I'm not convinced the evidence is very strong, CF-related diabetes. What are the risks of using uh, Captrio? So Captrio is three drugs. So you've got patients post-transplant are already on a very complicated regimen of, of treatments. They're on their anti-rejection medications, which can be complicated. They're also on a lot of maintenance antibiotics. Some are on maintenance antifungals and so forth. So there's a lot of medications they're taking post-transplant. You're adding three drugs onto that already complicated list, all of which have different interactions with other drugs. And that's a, a, a quite a common problem is that Captrio does interact with a lot of drugs that people will take around the time of transplant. So that's, that's, that's a concern. You've also got all of those side effects that I've mentioned. So people post-transplant have a lot of side effects already from their medication. Adding in Captrio can potentially put them at risk of even more side effects. So that's something we've got to be care careful about. And then of course, the interaction with transplant drugs. And we know that the tacrolimus, which is commonly used post-transplant, the levels can go very high when you start taking Captrio. So it has to be monitored very closely. And of course, then, if you're dealing with the non-pulmonary complications of CF, so sinus disease or GI disease, well, I mean, these are very expensive medications. And I, I, we know that the cost effectiveness of them is based on the fact that they are, have a significant impact on C, CF lung disease, which, as I said before, is the cause of much, such a, a huge amount of morbidity in CF. Uh, cost using the very expensive drugs for things like sinus disease and GI you know, may, not be, it may not be as cost effective. So there is some though studies out there that we can that have looked at the experiences with CF modulation in people post transplant, and and Kathy Ramos from Seattle uh, published a paper in JCF where they surveyed the CF centers that are the, the recognized CF transplant centers, and they asked them who they were giving the patients uh, Captrio to, why they were giving it to them, and then also then what the benefits were. So interestingly, if you look here at the table that is shown here, the indication for prescribing Captrio post-transplant was one, it was sinus disease, some GI symptoms, a smaller proportion, uh, diabetes, low body mass index, chronic lung allograft rejection was, a, was probably a small proportion, and a lot of it actually was a patient preference, which is an important factor, but again, I suppose when, when, when we're thinking about that cost effectiveness issue, it, 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 you know, it, it, we've got to be thinking about what are the real benefits of this treatment. And so what they showed was that there really wasn't a huge, there was no improvement in BMI, no real improvement in lung function, no change in rejection. There was a minor improvement in hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker we measure for diabetes. Uh, some improvement in anemia, which is a bit unexpected. And there was a significant reduction in the amount of IVs needed, but Again, the, the caveat is that this was also during COVID, when, the, when yeah, so the, 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 the pre-Captrio time was pre-COVID, and the, when they were on Captrio, it was also during COVID, so all exacerbations dropped then. 47% had to have a dose adjustment of their tacrolimus, which is their rejection medication. And of the 90 patients, 40 stopped taking it themselves. And the reason was because of side effects. A lot of them were GI. Now, it's interesting that there's a lot of GI side effects that go with some of the other transplant medication. So it was, um, it's not clear whether it was all uh, uh, Captrio related, but a lot of them also stopped it because of lack of perceived benefit. So they were now taking the three drugs and, and they didn't really feel there was much benefit. Another study, uh, which was published in pharmacotherapy uh, from a large CF center and a large CF transplant center in UNC, 
Uh, those had 13 patients that were given Captrio. The main indication was sinus and GI disease. What they found was that 46% uh, of them had some improvement in their sinus symptoms, and 32% had some improvement in their GI symptoms. But their BMI actually dropped, didn't go up, which is strange. Um, and then they, uh, they also had drug-drug interaction with tacrolimus. Some were able to reduce their creon, which may suggest slightly better absorption, but interesting that the BMI dropped. Um, 62% uh, stopped taking the drug, uh, five of them permanently. And the main reasons were a decline in FEV1 in, in two of them. And it's interesting, they're suggesting that when you take calf and you don't have CF, the CF pure protein in the lungs can actually be stimulated beyond, say it's normally 100%, it can go up to 120. So they, you can actually have more secretions be, be generated. And, that, and there's, they're hypothesizing that that might be a factor. They had GI pain and mood disorders, which you've mentioned are already side effect, known side effects of, uh, of uh, calf trio. And then they also stopped because of lack of benefit. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about pregnancy and CF2 or modulation as well, because prior to calf trio, uh, first of all, pregnancy on modulators wasn't that common. Uh, the risk benefit was usually assessed uh, in each patient. And then the balance of risk to, of clinical deterioration of, of the mother, if she was to stop her modulator, was balanced against the potential risk of exposure to CFTR modulators. Now, the risk of exposure to CFTR modulators during pregnancy, there's two uh, concerns that have been raised, but rarely seen, I will say. The first is that the liver function tests in a newborn may be affected. And the second is that there were some very early um, animal model studies suggesting the possibility of cataract formation in, these are in very, very young rats. And that was part of just the, the, how they study the safety of a drug. In the clinical trials in all pediatric cases, uh, patients, because of that, they often had eye exams. And, and actually, cataracts really weren't, very, weren't seen very often. But there's a, a concern that that's a, that's a possibility. So what's happened since CAF trio is that, firstly, there's been a very large increase in the number of pregnancies. In the US, it's doubled since, uh, since CAF trio uh, was approved. We've seen a, a significant increase in our own center. But what we now have, though, is a treatment where there really are substantial benefits uh, for, the, for the mother. Lung function's improved, exacerbation rates are very good, nutrition is much better, uh, and, th and these are all really important factors for a, a pregnancy. So we think the risks of stopping are now greater. So most people who are staying on CAPTRIO, or sorry, who are pregnant on CAPTRIO will stay on it. But we do need more safety, a data on safety and efficacy. So there has been a study that was done and published in the US uh, by Jennifer Taylor Couser, and this was published two years ago, where they surveyed the US centers that were using CAF Trio and asked them uh, their experience with pregnancies. They had 45 ETI exposed pregnancies and 40 completed at the time of, the, of this report. Uh, very few uh, complications that they felt were CAF Trio related. Um, now, not every newborn was screened for, for uh, cataracts, but they felt that overall that they seemed to be, the complication rate seems to be very low. And um, it's so it, it, Catrio appears to be safe. But what they did notice was that in six patients who elected to stop taking Catrio, that five deteriorated. One had actually a very severe exacerbation, and the others had what would be somewhere between a mild and a moderate exacerbation. So I think that the, the feeling was that we do need more safety data, but that in most cases, uh, continuing Catrio during pregnancy seems the benefits seem to outweigh the risks. There is a study ongoing right now called the Mayflower study, and that's monitoring the safety of ETI in pregnancy. And uh, that is continually going to be reporting more and more information that will help guide these decisions. But that's where things stand at the moment. So the, I'm going to conclude now uh, with the take home messages. And that is that Catrio has substantial clinical benefits in lung function, exacerbations, quality of life and nutrition in our patients with F508L mutations that is confirmed in large real world studies. Uh, people with CF though, with milder disease, they may tolerate reductions in inhaled hypertonic saline and DNA, but this needs to be closely monitored and they should talk to their CF clinicians about that if they're thinking about doing it. And they should not stop continue, uh, uh, taking their inhaled antibiotics. There really isn't any, anything to support that right now. Um, I think there may be a role for CAF trio in selected CF patients post transplant but we do need more data. And as you see, it's again, it's something that we would need to um, be very careful about who you select and who you choose to go into treatment because there are significant potential negative effects of it. 
Um, and then the benefits of calf trio during pregnancy seem to outweigh the risks. Uh, but these risks and benefits should be discussed with each uh, mum, either planning to get pregnant or at the time of pregnancy confirmation. Uh, and then what, what we have done is we're working with Hollis Street to make sure that when, a, if, it, if the uh, mum is on ETI during uh, pregnancy, that the fetus would be, or the uh, newborn baby would be screened for uh, cataracts, for liver functional abnormalities uh, as soon as it's born. So that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much.